Cain by Gene Toomer, a 1923 Harlem Renaissance masterpiece, a work of modernist fiction that I think really helped push some views and challenge people to think about things in ways they hadn't thought of before. My name's Una, and today Crypto and I are going to be joined by our friend Jack over at the Rambling Raconteur because Cain is a work that I think challenges people in a lot of different ways. And we don't all have the same views or conclusions about it. But the more time we spend dissecting it from its poems to prose to adapted plays, the closer we get to unlocking some of the things that we see in our day-to-day -day lives. So let's talk with Jack today about Cain as a whole. All right, so the first question of the night, Jack, is how did you hear about Cain originally? That's a really good question because almost nobody ever hears about Cain. Uh, it is not generally regarded as one of those works that pops up on top novels of the 20th century lists. Uh, it is not a work that's required reading in a lot of university courses or for the AP literature exam or something like that. Sometimes uh, certain poems are pulled from it, but almost never the short fiction works. And so I had come across it um, just by happenstance. For some reason, there were just enough colleges assigning it. I think that Norton Critical did a Norton Critical edition of Kane, and I kind of recognized that spine. And so I was like, Kane, I've never heard of this. Um, I was like, is this a, like a is, is this the book that was used for Citizen Kane? I mean, really, I had no <laughs> idea what it was. Legitimately, I think I was 18, 19. And so I just kind of picked it up and was like, I've never heard of this author. I've never. You know, I had read Their Eyes Were Watching God. I had read Invisible Man. I had read Native Son at that point. Um, but I had never heard of Cain, legitimately. And so I just kind of read it and I was like, this is really interesting. I didn't really think about it in terms of its historical context, its cultural context. It was truly just because it was that edition. It was a spine that I recognized at a used bookstore and I took a chance on it. What about you guys? For me, you know, it kind of like goes in one ear out the other because you'll be reading literature, reviews, people that talk about the Harlem Renaissance, right? And a lot of time this is cited as started, which is kind of unfair to say this started the Harlem Renaissance because it was really unknown at the time. But now people go back in time and they're like, oh, actually, this was really good. This, <laughs> this is something that we should talk about because it's, it's bringing in some things and talking about things openly that traditionally have not been allowed or have not been talked about openly. So I th it's kind of interesting to see here it kicked off the Harlem Renaissance because if it did, it sure did it silently. And to me, like you see that in literature, but it's just kind of in one ear out the other. Like I've heard about it, like, oh, that might be something to, to check out one day. And we had uh, the short story prose, actually, Becky, in a short story collection. And we read that, and I was like, this this is a masterpiece. I, there's more like this. I need that in my brain. So I talked about it with with Crypto here, and we said, okay, let's let's do this whole thing, but how do we do it? right? If we just if we just do the talk of, of the book as a whole, you know, there's so it's too easy to gloss over so many of these poems, which have nice and amazing little nuggets and looks at into the the real culture and history of America. That we're like, let's let's do an in depth, even though we know that there's not a huge return on it. We know that not a lot of people are even talking about it now. We we think this is a book that deserves a deeper look, and and that's why we went down the poem by poem, you know, short story by short story discussion of, of the entirety of Cain, and, and because it's so interconnected, you know, which, which we need to get into today, we said, well, we need to step back and have a broader conversation too, which is why it's great to, to get with you, someone else who also loves and appreciates Kane, I believe. Well, I definitely love it. And I, I've, I've read it a couple of times. I, you know, was rereading it for this discussion and it was interesting. I think the last time I read it, it was the poetry that just jumped out at me and, and, um, the, the, the cyclical nature of it is really interesting, and I can't wait to discuss that in more detail, but the poetry was really what jumped out at me, and, and the way that it was in the poetry that it felt like Toomer was bravest in terms of what he wanted to confront about the reality of his experiences, the reality of his family's experiences, his contemporaries' experiences, um, and the way that he was able to confront it so directly and with very specific imagery and yet also just incredible, you know, beauty and, and to not shy away from, yes, this is horrifying, but there are also moments that are really beautiful. The way that, um, what is it, copper wires and the way that the concept of electricity is juxtaposed with um, the beauty of a black woman in the, in the U.S. is fa it, it, absolutely fantastic. And there's almost nothing like that that's been published 
1923, or you know, these many of these works were coming out in small magazines um, as the book was coming to fruition. Do you think that this being a hidden gem is what lends its magic to what it kind of represented for the time period? Or do you think that this is just unknown because of it? It kind of pales in comparison of being in the syllabi uh, of schools from his other works, because after reading this now in its entirety and the way that we've read it and being able to digest it the way that I have, I feel that it, it is Tumor's magnum opus compared to his other works. Uh, I was very intimidated by the poetry, but with being able to, to piece it together and talk about it, uh, being handheld through a lot of the poetry, it, it really has been something that is truly magical. So I, I wonder why is this not something that's number one in the, the tumor universe? Why is this not number one work as an AP lit teacher, not pulling out some of these poems to teach in class to use as, you know, all the different ways that this could be, uh, taught and, and used as literature pieces, uh, historical and as literary devices. What, why do you think that is? That's a really good question. And I, I frankly don't know the answer to that. You know, I, I don't teach in the in an English or social studies department. And when I talk to students, this is one of the books I'll, I'll, I'll sort of I keep stock sort of my own private three shelf library in the corner of my classroom. And students can just borrow a book that sometimes I have two copies of it and I'll just give them a copy of uh, that I've come across. And this is one that, you know, um, I've worked in a lot of urban schools and this is a book that as students read it, a lot of them come back to it. Um, this is up there with uh, Richard Wright's Black Boy in terms of the books that some of my students will want to read, reread, you know, borrow, especially if they're in high school and they've, they've met me as a ninth grader and they'll stop by and reread it uh, or, or say, hey, I was thinking about this and they'll take it and, and you know, take a screenshot of a specific poem they were thinking about. Um, and there is, you, you mentioned the hidden gem quality. Isn't there always that nature of like feeling like you've discovered something that wasn't handed to you? And I think a lot of times in schools, we, the curriculum, the education industrial complex, whatever it is, just hands a work to a student and says like, you need to read this and you need to appreciate it. And if you don't, it means these things about you as a thinker, as a student, as a learner, as a potential you know, successful adult one day. Um, and so there is that that beautiful nature of discovering something and then you have to make the decision. Do you talk to anybody else about it or do you keep it to yourself? Because uh, it, it's sort of a, a private thing. Um, and I wonder with the way that Kane really strikes deep uh, into the realities of segregation in the U.S. Um, I mean, he in one of the poems, I, I was the portrait in Georgia, uh, Georgia, hair, braided chestnut, coiled like a lyncher's rope. I mean, he doesn't shy away from it. It's like there in the poetry, it is confronting like the horrifying reality that is really not that distant um, for way too many folks that maybe that isn't something they, they want to dwell on or think about or share uh, because because it, it just cuts so deeply like into, into a person's identity. Um, so I'm not sure why it isn't up there on every list as when you're talking about modernist literature in the US, this is like a, a top five work to mention. Uh, when you're talking about early 20th century works, when you talk about the Harlem Renaissance, we spend a lot of time on Langston Hughes, um, justifiably. We spend a huge amount of time. Like at my school, the, the junior English department is uh, having students start, their eyes were watching God today. Like they, they started reading it today, the day after the ACT. And there, there are students who are wrapped with attention because that book's a masterpiece. But somehow Kane just, you know, it, it is somehow missed by that current. It's like the... The interstate was built in American literature, and this outpost that was off the off the main highway doesn't get explored very often, which which is too bad because I think it is a masterpiece. I do want to answer my own question a little bit here. I kind of felt like this this was one that is hard to identify and swallow the bitter truth of our past, and as you quoted the poem there, if you're a young person of color in high school, college, and you have this very racially charged language 
and you're going to identify it with it. But if you're not that person, how do you identify with that? What can you get out of that? And for me, I know that if I was reading this as an 18 year old crypto, uh, I would have struggled with it, especially the poetry. I would have, I would have struggled with identifying with this. What does this mean to me? What am I getting out of this? And if I'm forced into this, I'm going to be very, very reluctant to enjoy it, right? Because it's hard to enjoy something that's pushed upon you. And that if I found it by accident, then what am I going to get out of it? Because I even being pretty well read, um, I needed a hand. I, where are you at? You're over there. <laughs> I, I needed a hand to kind of guide me through this uh, to get maximum experience and enjoyment out of it. Uh, so I, I think that that's something to be said about this, um, that this masterpiece. Do you think when you were struggling through it, quote unquote, do you think that this struggle, because if you think about how this came out, we, we already mentioned that it wasn't very popular, even though critics enjoyed it, even though critics pushed it both from the black and the white reviewers, it, it, it didn't take off, Right. You, you both have mentioned the idea of the road being paved, right? So by 1937, when their eyes were watching God comes out, right? We have, This is 15 years after Cain, right? Which, you know, Du Bois writes about how it was the first to really push black sexuality. It was the first to talk about it openly because you had a lot of repression. You had a lot of people that said that it's not okay to talk about that. And what I think is so so interesting to me as someone who's just reacting, who's reading Cain and, and just saying, okay, what does this mean to me? Is is the way that these characters are... Uh, first of all, when we talk about characters, there's a question of how much do they represent reality? And to me, these are kind of... And I'd love to get your guys' opinion. These are watercolors. The, the, these are... are are impressionistic paintings that as much as I love this book, there, there's different ways to love the book. These aren't real people per se, but it's like taking an archetype, putting them in a situation and then having a conversation about it. And it was the first one in the time to talk about black love, black sexuality, uh, black happiness, right? Without having to necessarily always define itself against racism, right? It's the idea that it lives there. It is different because of of the experience being different from a, being a person of color in America at the time, but the ability to just take a magnifying glass and, and look at those moments, those vignettes, and paint them in this picture, I think is is what makes this book so beautiful. To answer your question real quick, I think that why I struggled with it is because there are so many layers. I mean, we, we've hinted around so many different topics already that there is so much in this book and we haven't even discussed, let, let's talk about the religious aspect of it. Let's talk about the symbolism aspect of it. Let's talk about the historical aspect of it. Let's talk about the, the Harlem Renaissance and moving back and forth between the North and the South. And uh, there, there's a lot to this book. And so coming into it ignorant as, as, a, as a young person, if reading it as 20 year old crypto, uh, would have struggled. And I think even as an older person, better read, still going to struggle with it. And so I think having a buddy is, is going to make this book a little bit more enjoyable. Uh, and I think that you're going to be able to get a, a lot more out of it. So I think one of the things that's really interesting is how you brought up the idea of the archetype of characters. And, um, and you, you mentioned as well, the Becky story, which is sequenced as one of the earliest stories or vignettes, sketches, however you want to describe it, in the book. And there's something about that story where there's such a, a push and pull going on, where the narrator almost is trying to distance like the narration from Becky and this idea of like, wait a second, that this person lived like in our society. This person grew up in my town and had these children. And, and this is kind of how there, there's this narrator who's almost saying this is this this really happened to somebody it doesn't matter what the person's name was we don't get to know Becky Becky has I mean does Becky even share a single word of dialogue in that story um and yet the empathy that it generates 
for her or the sympathy, depending on one's experiences, is magnificent. And the way that there's this distance that the narrators are trying to like kind of insinuate. And yet as a reader, you you have to make a choice. Like, am I distanced with the narrator or am I feeling something for, for, for Becky and for her sons? And like it, picturing this house with the chimney by the railroad track. And as you get drawn in, you start to realize like, wait a second, I'm getting closer to this person than the narrator ever was. And what does, what does that mean? And so as Crypto said, there are those layers that it's very subtle. It insinuates, it provokes an emotional response and a sort of an intellectual response simultaneously. And they're pushing against each other in the reading experience. And because the works are so concise and so short, you know, there's a couple that are like longer, almost full stories, but so many of them are just very brief. It's, as you mentioned, it, it's like a watercolor, but it's not as if you get to sit and look at the watercolor when you first read it. It's almost as if the watercolor flashes by your eyes, like the car passing or something, and you see it for a moment and you immediately are thinking and trying to reconcile your reaction to it. Uh, and, and it's a work that sort of demands that there's almost no story that doesn't get you to start reflecting and thinking. Um, there, there's nothing that feels tossed away. Or thrown away and the way that the first arc I, what i remember thinking was the first arc was seemed to almost all be set in the south and i remember also thinking like why the heck are these there are these like <laughs> curves as this, the book's mm -hmm. progressing mm -hmm. but the first arc seems set in the south and then as you progress suddenly you're somewhere else you're in a theater and, and you're seeing you know folks as you said dancing having fun interacting with each other and and having you know there there are tragedies and there are private emotional tragedies, but it's not a social tragedy that they're experiencing. They're experiencing like, you know, full, full lives and starting to think, wait a second, like this is different. This is different from what I've read and having to go back and reread sections. Um, but there was just something so compelling about it when I was reading it. You mentioned about how the narrator had some distance when he or she was reflecting upon the story of the town's reaction. It kind of reminds me a little bit of like the uh, Rose for Emily problem of, of how the narrator is a collective pronoun of we. We, the town, are reacting to this situation. And you see that even with Reapers, like the poem or Cotton Song. It's very clear that there, there's a distance there. And then by the end of the poem, though, you know, and... and, and Throughout this whole this whole story, who, who's the main character is, is one question we need to ask. And, and that's a loaded question. I, I get it. But but you almost move into the characters more. I almost feel like the you start to have more empathy, more sympathy, as you said, to to based on your life experiences, where you're entering by the end into Cabinus, you're having the existential crisis with with Ralph. You're wondering, do I belong here in the South, right? And you almost can put yourselves, I, I say we, I say I, and a lot of times, like I, when I'm editing these videos and posts, I'm like, what did I mean by we or I there? Because am I saying I'm in the person of, of color category? Of course not. Am I saying I'm an American? Am I saying, you know, someone who's gone through that suffering? But it's it's that blend where in the beginning, you're in this space where you're, to your point, you know, reflecting on the characters and distance. But by the end, it's almost like this, like, you know how like free and direct speech, you start from a distance, but then suddenly you are the character. I kind of feel like that happens with Kane, as you start from like the personal and the physical, and you move into the, the, the identity and ultimately into the existential of who should I be? Isn't that truly what happens in kind of our history? And I think that's where I, I love how Toomer takes the evolution of our country. And if we think about the we, who is the main character of Cain? It's America. It's the birth of our nation. It's the growing pains we go through. And I think he was almost a little prophetic of the existential crisis that we will continue to have in our culture if we continue to hold on to that North and South differences. And that's where Cabinets at the end was at, right? And just like we are today, still trying to figure it out, so was he. And it's open to interpretation. So let me bring it back to that question then. Who is the main character, per se, of Cain? Because each story, it's, it's a reset, right? In the poems, sometimes you're 
sometimes the main character is a street. You, you mentioned earlier in the second cycle, it opens up with 7th Street, right? They were opening up on literally a street that is considered a hotbed of activity for the Great Migration in Washington, D.C., right? You've got Beehive, right? Are we talking about bees? Are we talking about people in the city? It's, it's questionable, right? But every single story, too, also, uh, particularly in the beginning and the first part, every single of the prose pieces is named after the female until you get to the last one, which is suddenly called Blood Burning Moon, right? So, so the main character is kind of a loaded question, but to me, I think we're... So, so you say America, crypto. I wonder, is it um, America's awareness of what does it mean to have this this difference in color? Because you can have a different experience in America based on the color of your skin, and you can be looked at and judged differently based on that. So it's almost kind of like wrestling with the question of what is my experience and consciousness in relation to this racial question? And not just color, right? <laughs> right. Well, what, so one of the things, I, I do think, though, that Cain is specifically this quilt or tapestry made up of threads or patches of the African-American experience or of black experience in, in the United States um, because he, sh he shows so many different sides of that. Um, and that, that's something that as, as I, you know, have, have read more and more in the intervening years and reread Kane, one of the things I'm always struck by is just how wide geographically diverse the experiences are that he wants to bring our attention to. And the way that little like class divisions that exist are, are um, explored, the way that the slang phrase dicty is used uh, to show sort of the, the way that, you know, some folks would look at other folks and say like, Hey, there's a class division from us. Yes. Like we're all, we're, we're all, we're all viewed from other people as being identical because of our skin color. But in reality, like within our community, there are divisions that like you're able to go do things, you know, your, your father owns a store. And so you get to, you know, have certain things that I don't get to have because I don't, you know, my family doesn't have even that small amount of wealth. Um, and I, th I think that in, in a way sort of prefigures uh, some of the divisions that would happen and, and sort of spring into like more light in the 1950s with uh, uh, desegregation of schools and with um, the civil rights movement and how, you know, th there were generational divisions and, and even class divisions around, well, how do we how do we achieve the rights, you know, how, how would individuals achieve the rights for themselves and for their community and um, what the way what the right way was to go around it. And it's interesting to think about the, you know, there are certain poems that almost have the point of view where there's the one, the, the early one about the side that's like cut the mouse. Reapers. And it's, yeah. We, yeah. And we, we think of the, the, all the different points of view that are in there. And, the, but what is the image, I guess, that we're left with in some of the poems is less who's the character and more, what is the image? Um, and that's kind of the way I think about Cain. I think crypto you experienced something similar in our discussion here recently where you said you know your experience with with poetry is is newer and recent and you said but one thing that you've noticed or felt like with how you've reacted is that it becomes more emotional that that it, it, you're able to kind of let go not that it can't be intellectual but sometimes you're able to let go of that and just react right and and Kane is something that kind of weaves and bobs between poetry, between prose, between dramatized plays, if you will, that I think all of them, though, do achieve that ability just to react, that ability to emote um, is something that I think you shared. And I think the poems are a great segue bridge between those stories. They set you up. They, they get you emotionally charged. And that's why I enjoyed how we read them. And, and you can read it in its entirety, and I think you'll be fine. But I do think that those poems are the glue that bind everything together. And, and as, as you brought up uh, earlier, that they are probably the most important pieces of the story because they're the things that are going to give you that leverage to understand what's coming forward. And I think that with what you were talking about of the the differences of what was experienced. I wonder where is the litmus test here? Where is the, the starting point of what I'm going to see and what, what is important in these poems and in the prose? And I think that Toomer was giving us choices for that. 
and that's what the poems do is there's so much more interpretation to those poems for me and maybe different for you because you could go a more intellectual route and you could break down all the little pieces and you know what is the i tectameter things and stuff right or the 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 rhymes there there is that uh, of course but you can just read it and just have your heart broken and that's okay and that's what's so beautiful about this piece is there is no wrong way to read it and even though we've talked briefly about it being cyclical and how the 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 story comes full circle i would love to talk with somebody that broke the mold and didn't read it in order in order in quotes because i think that would be a unique experience as well well that that's part of the beauty of a modernist work right is is a lot of those works they they experimented with what we what i shouldn't say what we the the novel had this incredible tradition of being wildly experimental like early early novels for hundreds of years were wildly experimental early prose works were experimental and then somewhere along the way, 18th, 19th century, they, it sort of just became, hey, these need to be real stories about real folks. And th this needs to be about stuff that really happened. And the rest of that is just a bunch of, you know, romances or fantasies. That, that, that's, a, that's not serious literature. That's not speaking about our people in our time. Um, and, and that tradition mm -hmm. persists in a, in a lot of ways <laughs> through the 20th century. <laughs> but, the, but the modernist works were really interesting because they sort of went in and said, hey, we're going to take a sledgehammer to your idea of time and linearity and narrative. Like, we're going to take a sledgehammer to that. And it, it's true about so many modernist works that you can sort of start at the beginning and read through to the end. And you go, wait a second, that has shifted everything I understood. And it's not because there's a surprise ending or a twist, but it's because something you thought was important means something different or something that you didn't think was important is very critical. And, and as, as you mentioned, the glue, I could see someone reading this work and just being like, I'm just reading the stories. I'm just going to skim the poems mm -hmm. and then going back and upon rereading it, being like, wait a second, the poems are the most important part. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I think of a work like The Sound and the Fury. The Sound and the Fury is brutally nonlinear. And Benji lays the whole story out for you on a platter. I mean, the, the whole story is laid out for you in those first pages, but you have no idea that that's what's happening. And it's only after you've read the whole book and you go back sometime later and you're like, I'm going to try and nail this one now that you realize, wait a second, that's a clue. That's a hint. I, I got that. I picked that up. And it's it's just amazing that in 1923 and in the years leading up to that, I think like he started in 1921, Toomer's putting this together in a way where you can come in and, and drop into the middle. You can read Blast Arc or... You can choose your own adventure in a sense for how do you appreciate cane? Mm -hmm. What's your path through the cane field? That's a good comparison to compare it against other modernist works, right? Because it feels strange to compare it to, I believe you've mentioned to me before that you'd even almost compare it to Dubliners by James Joyce. And I might even compare, honestly, we just got done recording some Catherine Mansfield tonight, right? Like all modernist writers. And to your point, they have that meandering element. But one of the main things that I really enjoy actually about modernism, which is the bane of some people's existence, is the lack <laughs> of resolution sometimes, right? It's okay to just talk about the problems. It's okay to just have conflict and, and then just cut the story there to allow the reader to say, what does that mean? Like, is that okay? And that invites, I feel like, readers to then pass judgment to say, is this acceptable for us? Is there something that we should change about who we are or how we react to certain situations? And I think a lot of these modernist works that lack that resolution, to me, I think Kane is like that too, where it leads you up to the precipice of when you would need to say something or it would always be too late and you'd never to be able to do something again. That's that's where Tumor excels is being able to cut the story at that point in time. Isn't that kind of the point though of of the modernist novel is to get us talking in conversation? That's what we're all about is having these conversations, having the hard conversations and then growing from it. And that's what I love about this piece is it's something that's so unique that has allowed me to have that and that's a a, a gift. That's something that uh, will forever change me. And uh, I, you know, I look forward to more poetry now because it's a, it's something that is a wanted challenge. 
Yeah, I, I think you're onto something with with the idea of the modernness that real life has one resolution and it comes for all of us. <laughs> but the reality is so many things that seem like a resolution aren't, you know, even, even relationships that seem like they've, they've been fractured. Sometimes they come back relationships that seem formidable and that they will live happily ever after slowly falter apart and disintegrate sadly. Um, and, and so real life, is not resolved. <laughs> it is it is constantly in motion. It's constantly in flux. And the modernists, I think, as, as sort of an, an ethos was re the rejection of authority in a, in a number of different ways. But one of those was an, a rejection of the authority of resolution, that the idea that a book is going to change everything by telling you how to solve it. Mm. It's not going to do that. It's going to shine a light in corners you maybe haven't paid attention to. It's going to open the door to that room that you just stuff everything into at the back of your house that you don't ever invite anybody to. It's going to do that. But it's not going to tell you what to do to clean that room. It's not going to do to, to you know tell you what to do with the the this leak in your ceiling. That, as you said, you have to do something about that um, as a reader. And, and your choice might be to do nothing. That is in itself a choice. But th there's something about that that feels so close to modernism. And for Toomer, I think it was very much a reality of like, this better not be the resolution. This better not be the best that we can offer. And the best that, that you know, myself, my family, my, my contemporaries, um, that African-Americans can, can have in this country. There, there needs to be something different. And he shows ideas. He shows the theater. He shows the dances. He shows fun. And he shows all of that. Um, but he's not afraid to show, you know, it's even show his hand where he shows a, a relationship that maybe could be something. Maybe it, maybe maybe they can have the happy ending. And then the way he ends that story is sort of that's where he sort of shows and is like, hey, you you need to make a choice at the end of this. Don't, don't be like these archetypes. Do something. Do you think that's what defines um, a masterpiece of a modernist is that it's not a. It's not an instruction book. It's not a how-to guide, you know, uh, how to think, how to be a better person. It, it's it's um, a roadmap with no signs. And I, I love that. Do you, do you think that's why this and other books like it are, are timeless and are masterpieces? Well, I can say that in 2004, on the AP literature exam in the U.S., the FRQ question was often was something, para I'm paraphrasing, but... Uh, a great work of literature often asks a question without giving the answer. Write an essay about this. <laughs> and, I, and I think, you know, it, it's that's something that is hammered at us that, you know, masterpieces raise questions, they illuminate something, um, but they don't necessarily give us the answer. We, we as readers get to interact with it um, and, and reconcile the ideas the the cognitive dissonance that occurs whether it's artistic whether it is emotional whether it's intellectual we we have to reconcile that and wrestle with it and and hopefully uh we grow as, as people in some way we communicate with some other aspect of the human experience that we would not have had we not read that book i wonder if there were any students that used kane as their example in 2004. <laughs> I definitely used crime and punishment, <laughs> oh, but I, I definitely went with crime and punishment. Yeah. <laughs> you know, when we look at crime and punishment or other works of that, we have a clear, we, we have a clear from the writer's perspective idea of what morality is. You know, Dostoevsky clearly <laughs> Russian Orthodox. It, <laughs> And the idea of what is sin, what is redemption is thusly defined by this book. Something interesting about Cain, to, to your point about this modernist idea of, of the raising the questions, is it layers over a lot of that, that the era of, you know, 1600s, 1700s, of you have an African religion that is believed, accepted, but by, by many people, you have a lot of uh, Muslim imports as well. But, but he sticks with, with a lot of the African religion, of course, in, in this text. And then he starts to layer over it with conversion, the, the poem, where he starts to talk about how the African God meets the Christian God and how those two interact. And you have this consciousness question of the people who have Christianity now being pushed upon them because it talks about slavery, it talks about the suffering having value and redemption, and you start to see all these characters talk about 
redemption? How do I redeem all the suffering and problems that I've been put through in life that seems unfair that other people haven't, right? The fact that that tumor layers these, these religions on top of it, and it makes you question what is the morality system, is I think very brilliantly done. How did you guys react to some of those discussions? Um, so there's there's an aspect to the poetry. I, so I remember this the first time I read it, and it's something that I, I spot every time I read it, where there are the poems that very consciously echo the idea of what, what were sometimes termed the slave spirituals or the ring shouts, um, which, which is interesting because those weren't those weren't necessarily popularly available for, for you know, there, there had been uh, field recordings artists who had gone out and tried to record versions of the songs um, to transcribe. And yet they weren't widely regarded as, as poetry. And yet now when library of America published it, it's um, African-American poetry anthology a couple of years ago, there was a whole section of old like spirituals. And so tumor shows that side, but as you said, he, he, he makes it very, he's so clear about you. And I don't know who he's writing this necessarily for in his audience, but there's some aspect of, of what he's writing. And I think he was very explicit about wanting to be, to be viewed as an American writer, as a U.S. writer, not simply at, and, and pigeonholed as an African-American writer, where there's something where he wants to tell an audience that doesn't know him and doesn't know, you know, the, the, the people he regards as, as his community, the people he's lived with. Um, they don't know that experience. And he wants to say, you think you know this, you, you have an image. You have a very specific image when I say a black American in the Southeastern US, like, like you know, someone whose grandparent was a slave, like you have an image of that person. And he, there's almost this aspect of Cain where he's showing, yes, people do live those lives. They live those experiences. They have those beliefs, those traditions, uh, those practices, but there's a whole other side. There are so many more experiences. There are so many more voices. There are so many more beliefs. And conversion kind of runs up there in the, like, this was real. This is, the, you know, you. It, it's almost a poetic version of Frederick Douglass's um, 4th of July speech, where he said, what does the 4th of July mean when you're reading this, this statement about the Declaration of Independence, and yet you have all of these individuals enslaved? What, what, what is this supposed to mean to me? And there's an aspect of conversion that kind of gets at that, that says, wait a second, you know, you, you, you claim that we're all created. You claim that you, you read a book that says God is love and you have, you have, you know, the second commandment is love thy neighbor in the new Testament. And yet, how are you doing that? How is this bearing out in, in, in life? And what does that mean for everyone, you know, who has had these shared experiences like I have and, and, um, there's something very powerful about that. There's something that is just unflinching. Um, and yet, as I said, and as you point out, he's showing such a wealth of experiences. When we talk about morality, I think that's a very subjective term, right? Who's morality? Um, how do you define that? Are you getting your reality from your religion? And what does that mean to you? What does that mean to us? How do you implement that? That's, that's tough. And I think that Tumor is calling that out of, like you said, how can you have a high, how, how can you take the high high road, a, a moral high ground, and still have people enslaved? That doesn't seem to compute to him. And that he's saying, as a peoples, if we are moving forward, how what what is that going to look like? How do we come together as Americans and start to incorporate these different things without it being forced upon us, giving a choice in the matter, because they weren't. Names were taken, families were taken, religions were oppressed, sexuality was oppressed, and now all this is being rediscovered for themselves, and then it's being discovered for the first time in the North, and that's changing everything. Our music, our speech, our slang, our dress, what we look like, all of that is evolving over time. And I think as the, the story comes cyclical, you have to be ready for that change because you never know where in the circle you're going to find yourself and that you're going to keep moving forward along that circle in this, this grand scheme we call America. That's a really great way to think about it is you don't know, you know, if you think of the arc and the cycle, that's just a really great idea of, 
the the idea of of where are we as a time perhaps within this circle but where am i as an individual and how that changes across our lives that's a really great note so if i'm asking all the controversial questions here my next one would be now cain has come under fire for how it represents women both from i think alice walker du bois said that he was <laughs> confounded by some of the characters saying why would he put this unconscious wanton in here and you know there's repeated silencing of their voices right there's repeated attacks upon them violence upon them with very little repercussion from what we would expect from like a catharsis and seeking of justice perspective from the usual, you know, if we're coming out of this morality talk, how readers typically expect to see evil punished. That's lacking in this modernist work, which we said, you know, is a, a typical modernist is to raise the question. How do you think that, how, okay, how the controversial question is, how do you think Toomer represented women well in this work? And how do you think he poorly represented them if you think there's an element to both of those i think that the truth hurts i think that he did it well because this is how a lot of times i think women were defined by the way that they were treated whether they were a person of color or not maybe he went a little ham-fisted on some things but he made a point right we're talking about it a hundred years later and do we still have some of those experiences in our country in 2023? Sure. I think that oh, I don't have those experiences, but there are people out there that are, that are treated that way. So I think that good and bad, um, again, I think is subjective. The, I don't think that any writer is going to be able to write something that they don't maybe personally know perfect. And even if they do, it, it's going to be open to your interpretation from your point of view. Sorry, I, I think it's a great question, Crypto. I was just, uh, no, sorry, Una, I was trying to count and compare the number of characters who are women in Kane, even as archetypes, to the number of characters who are women in Moby Dick. And I feel like Kane has more. <laughs> just as a thought, just as, just as a, a thought problem there. Um, I, I think it's fascinating that this is the type of criticism that's leveled at Kane. Uh, almost almost to distract from the real message. Uh, many of the women don't speak. Many of these stories are being written in the year after women are finally allowed to vote in the US. You know, that the, the women are silenced and they are in, in many cases um, victims of violence. That was something that happened continually. We had, we had presidents who perpetrated that type of violence against um, black women here in the US that that was, and it was known. Um, so to, to me, tumor illuminates that reality. And it is horrifying, it is tragic, it is depressing. He also though shows women who are happy, who are having uh, fun, who are able to go to dances. And and so he shows he shows a, a fairly wide variety, I think of experiences. Um, the reality is, as crypto pointed out was the reality was awful in many ways. Um, and could he have, could he have articulated some of these ideas better? I think, uh, sure, sure. But, but every work is going to have these types of, um, you know, particularly with something that's very short, you're, there are going to be, uh, perspectives or voices that aren't fully fleshed out. Um, but, but I, 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 to me, that feels like a distraction criticism, that, that happens rather than a, uh, a necessarily legitimate criticism. And Alice Walker championed Zora Neale Hurston and in some ways like really helped push their eyes were watching God specifically out as this mm -hmm, work of, mm -hmm. hey, everybody needs to read this. Yeah. Um, and, and so I applaud Alice Walker for that every year. Uh, but but I, I don't know that we need to attack Kane in order to lift up, you know, their eyes were watching God. That that's an incredible book. Everybody should read it. I think everybody should also read Kane. Do you think follow up question that maybe they're hypercritical because it is another man writing about a woman trying to give her a voice, and then you have a book like that by Hurston, who is a woman writing a woman's perspective finally, 
and doing it masterfully. Do you, do you think that's why maybe it gets some unfair criticism? It's just like if me trying to write a person of colors experience during slavery, like that would come off as, you know, crass. <laughs> I'll tell you, so my perspective to respond to the controversial and then don't, don't let me lose track because I lose track easily <laughs> to move over to Hurston. I've constantly wondered, am I, t I tend to be very forgiving in my view of things. I, I want to view the best of people because there's very few authors I think out there that are like, eh, I'm going to make people think negatively about this. Like, I just don't think that's a thing, but you have questions when it comes to Dr. Seuss, where you start to see prejudices come out where you're like, oh yeah, you're right. He does always paint these in a negative way and he paints these in a positive way. So I, I, th I don't think there's a lot of conscious negativity being put out by most authors, but I think unconsciously some stuff comes forward. So I have to apply that over Kane, And I'm like, well, where does Toomer fit on this? And I keep coming back to this idea of how you'll notice there's almost like an evolution of the women voices through this, where in the beginning they have no voice. They, to your point about Becky not having a single line of dialogue, I don't think, in that entire short story, or even Carantha, how she's objectified by the men in town, to eventually move into you have Doris, who wanted something in terms of the the uh, the theater, and then you move into uh, the you know the basketball game with Bono and Paul, where she actioned her desires, right? Like you start to see the women start to have a voice. If you look at the the structure, and I'm like, am I being too generous? And I really think that there was thought put into this, into the idea of also how the earlier stories are older in the Old South in times of slavery to the Great Migration into more modern times of 1923 and the later parts of the story just to kind of come full circle at the end. But you see this evolution of, of how are we changing to your point to just a year later or earlier we had the ability to finally have uh, voting rights and such changed. So to me, I, I almost justify it in some level of telling this long story arc through that because it is a short story cycle. These are connected. These were designed to work together in an order. To your point earlier, Crypto, about should we read it out of order? Um, to talk about it from Hurston's perspective, that's really hard to compare anyone to Hurston. Uh, anthropologist. Understood people to a level that I don't know if any other writer has truly attained. And I'm, I'm honest to God... Uh, that I mean that she has this ability, this piercing insight to understand people that I don't think any other author ever has, period. So the way that she writes Janie, the way that she she writes, you know, just the characters of, of all of her books when you read her are so deep, so rich and so real to to the perspective of your earlier point, Jack, about uh, we got to write realism, right? <laughs> like these are pl <laughs> they're plausible. These are plausible situations with plausible reactions and plausible, believable reactions from the characters. Cain, I don't think, attempts that on the same level. I think it is trying to depict problems, and I think it's trying to pull out those problematic situations so that we can have those discussions and reactions to it. Different purposes, right? I, agree. I mean, that, yeah. It, 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 it's not trying to do something it wasn't intended and I think that a lot of that hyper criticism comes to that. And of course, again, everything is different when you're looking back into the past. You can judge all you want, but I sometimes feel like that's unfairly. All right. So what's the next controversial question here, Una? All right. The next controversial question comes from our friend Jack over at the Rambling Rack and Tour. If you've, if you've heard of that channel, if not, I'm going to leave a link down below. You guys can all check them out. Great, great channel. Um, but, but Jack asked the question. When this was published, 1923, officially, I, I, I know there's different works being written and coming out at different times. But as a whole, coming out in 1923, is this the best work of U.S. fiction to be published to that date? Yeah, so this, this was a legitimate question I was thinking about um, while I was watching my daughters at swim class. And I started thinking, wait a second, like... This book, it predates, so so here, here are some works that, that it narrowly predates. Obviously it predates um, Their Eyes Were Watching God. It predates Native Son, which uh, Native Son and Their Eyes Were Watching God are often sort of pegged out as sort of the, the first African-American classics of the 20th century. Um, those are often the two that are assigned, you know, in schools and things justifiably. They're both incredible books. I highly encourage anybody who hasn't read them, check them out. Um, 
But th this predates those books. It predates Gatsby. It predates The Sun Also Rises. It predates The Sound and the Fury. So it predates a number of works that we think of as sort of the, the major, you know, U.S. really serious works. So here are some works that it would sort of compete against. Um, uh, Winesburg, Ohio by Sherwood Anderson. And I think there's a very reductive reading of Kane, which is, oh, it's like Winesburg, Ohio, except, you know, with African-American characters. I think it is emphatically. Have, you, have either of you read Winesburg, Ohio? Yeah. Okay. Do you no, think this yet. is as strong as Winesburg? No. Uh, I think it's stronger for sure. Okay, so do, so I don't even think it, I don't even think they're in like the same league. Um, so it, it it it's Winesburg, Ohio would be on the list. Um, Sister Carrie by Theodore Dreiser. I haven't read it. Okay, the, 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 that's one that I could see kind of folks pushing. Um, I feel like Sister Carrie's and, and Dreiser himself have sort of been falling out of favor more and more over the past I don't know 20, 30 years. But uh, that would be one that I think some folks would would push up against it. This Side of Paradise by F. Scott Fitzgerald, his first novel. I've mm. read that. You're not a Fitzgerald I, fan. I already know where that one's going. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I would put this as uh, master class versus kindergarten class, but... <laughs> not a Fitzgerald fan over here. <laughs> yeah, I'm not, a, I'm not a Fitzgerald fan. But I, well, that's my, you know... that, again, that's my unfair bias, so... Well, This Side of Paradise, it's, it's minor Fitzgerald, you know? Gatsby's obviously his masterpiece. <laughs> Passages and tenderest the night, but uh, you know, if you'd finished the love of the last word, time, Jack, I'm I'm quoting the squid and the whale. For anybody who's seen <laughs> oh, that, okay. it's it's minor Fitzgerald, um, the dismissive okay. child of two lit, yeah. lit professors and writers. But um, so it, this side of paradise, the beautiful and the damned, which is just a terrible book, and I'm not even going to mention um, it. Uh, what else? Okay, so here was the one that I started to think maybe this is sort of the maybe. Um, House of Mirth and The Age of Innocence by Edith Wharton. To me, those are the only two books in 20th century, you know, U.S. fiction up between 1900 and 1923 that that could compare with Kane. So I don't know if you've read either of those. Do you, uh, I haven't? Do you okay. think? Do you think your? Do you think this question would change if you start adding in more time? So if you start adding in. 17th 18th century etc you know you started throwing in Moby Dick Edgar Allan Poe is, is your is your is your answer going to change potentially because I think we're leading by, by the way limiting it to 1919 not that it's not a not fair question I, I think the three of us agree that this is probably if not top up there right right if you expand it even further back number one what you, you still put it as number one over Melville you know, all of his representation. The of Scarlet Roman. Letter. <laughs> Poe. I mean, you're a Poe fan, yeah. right? Are you going to put this as stronger than any any of the previous works in American literature? So here's a here's Poe, a but... here's a less controversial cop out. You you always have the um, Mount Rushmore idea of like if you were to pick four four works, and you go okay up to 1923 in U.S. fiction. Would this be among your top four? So now you you can have Moby Dick, you can have, you know, um, go chase the whale. Uh, you can have a Hawthorne novel or a uh, Edith Wharton novel. Um, there were a couple of Henry James books which do pop up, by the way, on the Modern Libraries list. So like I think Golden Bull, Ambassadors, Wings of the Dove are all early twentieth century. Um, if you have enjoyed reading those, I hope that you continue to enjoy Henry James. If you haven't read those yet, if you have some sleep issues, they might really help you with that. Uh, I've always felt I'm personally the only way. In there. <laughs> but so so would Kane would Kane measure up with you know the Red Badge of Courage, for example? That's a book that's widely read. But is that why, well, I, I mean, it's widely read. I mean, so like we, we yeah. talked about before, you said at the beginning of like Kane, it's not widely read. Right. So does something get to be in this list? I mean, is that why something, I mean, Moby Dick, it, is it on the list because it's well-known, because it's popular, because it, it was serialized, not, it was the serial idea of being just popular. Does that make it good? I don't think so. Like Moby Dick's boring. A thousand pages of nothing. 
It's a lot of whaling information. If you if you did not know enough about knots and other advanced whale techniques, Moby Dick will teach you them. <laughs> it, it's not for me, you know, and, and that's and, and that's a great thing about, you know, it, it's all of what you enjoy. And I, I think that Kane speaks to a lot of different people, I think. Yeah. And I, I just I think it's an incredible work. And, and I really as, as I was thinking, I was like, man, this sort of kicks off in some ways modernism the Harlem Renaissance, that there's just enough of it that, that feels like it kicks off the Harlem Renaissance to feel like, yeah, we'll call it a soft launch of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, oh, I like that. That it, it really does feel like this vital work that almost nobody talks about. Um, and it's shocking when when I look at the other works that are lifted up from, from that same time period, or as Una mentioned, from prior, prior periods, uh, it it feels like it is such a vital work. Well, there, there, there's rock stars in every field, right? Uh, those are the people that are remembered for whatever reason. And whether their name rhymes or, you know, they what color they were or how rich they were, uh, who they could buy off. That, I think that sometimes is why certain people get remembered and others get left behind is if you're not the rock star, then you're left to obscurity. And we have to be the people, the voices to keep those things going and alive so that they aren't lost to history of this should be something that is, you know, not mandatory, but more, you know, talked about, more circulated. Well, all right. Well, that is our discussion on Kane. I, um, I also have to admit, I, I planned on reading like more of the, like the, the analysis in the Norton critical edition, but I just, I don't know. I, 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 there's times where I just couldn't really get into it. And I was just really into Kane and I'm like, no, this is not, this is not how I wanted to experience Kane. So, uh, maybe, maybe that'll be for round three, I guess, since this was technically my round two on the book, but easy, easy. Uh, we joked about it being an 11 or 11 and a half out of 10. My, my book goes, my book goes to 11, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> But highly recommended, as is our friend's channel over here, Jack the Rambling Raconteur, who runs a wonderful channel. Uh, he's had a discussion up on Kane for, for well over a year or two now, so we're, we're just now getting to the party that he started a long time ago. Hey, thank you for joining us today. Room. Of course. Thank you, guys. This is, I'm, I'm glad. I really am glad that this is a work that's getting more discourse, more discussion, because there is so much still, unfortunately, for us to learn from it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Agreed. All right, everybody. Thanks for listening. Peace out. Peace.